Uh, one way that something could do a rootkit-like interception or man in the middling of system in order to either change data or capture data is by registering as a filter driver. Basically just having a kernel module and uh, uh, getting themselves put into this uh, device object chain targeting some particular device object that they uh, know data will be going towards that they care about. So in this case it was the thing like they knew the keyboard class is zero. There will eventually be keystroke data going up and down that chain. So they register themselves as an upper driver for that, upper filter driver for that. All right, so the second place where, um, where an attacker can register as a man in the middle, rather than adding themselves into this uh, chain explicitly, <coughs> instead they can just modify this uh, table of function pointers, which is associated with each of these driver objects. So this table of function pointers that's attached to the driver object structure, uh, it's basically a list of what type of IRPs this driver wants to hear about uh, when they're coming down the chain. So the way it uh, looks is there's this driver object structure. Uh, this is the, the actual driver object. And then there at the end, there's this major function array. It's an array of 28. Uh, function pointers. And for each of those, it's basically a function pointer that says, if a particular type of IRP is coming down that chain, then call my driver at this particular function. And so, you know, one way uh, an attacker can get that is just adding themselves in and calling into the function in their uh, driver object. And another way is instead of adding themselves into the chain, just find someone already in the chain at the level that they want to be at, and instead just rewrite that function pointer so that it calls their functions instead. So in this particular case, you know, an attacker, rather than registering above keyboard class zero, you could just wait for the stuff to come down to keyboard class zero level and just fill yourself in at that little array of function pointers so that when, keyboard cla when this uh, keyboard class driver would have found out that, hey, there's, you know, a packet coming down or a packet coming up, uh, it can just fill itself in at this function pointer table and, and hear about it that way. All right, so that's the, uh, the structure definition with all that attached function pointers. Uh, and then this is the structure definition for the device object. So I just want to make this kind of concrete here. So this has this little array of function pointers at the end, a driver object. The device object, as I said, it's kind of just to create that linked list in order to uh, see the associated things. So that's why there is, for instance, one, this one pointer to a driver object, that's that sort of horizontal pointer that we said, one uh, device object horizontally points to a driver object. And then there's these other things like uh, next device and attached device <coughs> that uh, corresponds to links within that chain. Uh, and then this is the actual IRP struct. I just put it in there for it's not particularly useful. It doesn't show you where that blob of data associated with it is, but there it is. Um, I guess the only reason I put it in there is that if you look at the wdm.h file, <coughs> it's the Windows driver model header file uh, used for kernel developers. That has actually comments in like pretty much every single one of these things where it's describing what they, what they actually do. And the thing is, even in this, the IRP, uh, just making a quick reference back to that kernel object hooking that we were talking about before. So we know this IRP is like a blob of data that's kind of going up and down this stack conceptually. Even in this, there's things like cancel routine, which are function pointers in here, where, you know, if this IRP is going down but it has to be canceled, uh, the, the uh, IO control manager is going to call that function. Is there another one in there? Mm, it doesn't look like it. But for instance, that cancel routine would be an example where an attacker, uh, if he, you know, knows where these I/O request packets are, he can go in and fill in this cancel routine, calling his cancel routine instead. Maybe he gets some benefit from that. Maybe he doesn't. But that would be an example of kernel object hooking. So as we just said, that major function thing at the very end of the uh, driver object is just an array of function pointers. So instead of adding yourself to the chain, you can just hack yourself into someone else's function pointer table who's already in the chain. 
So this is a list of the different types of IRPs uh, that can be going up and down the chain. So there's things like create or close or read or write, or directory control. So the, like I said, the point is these are supposed to be sort of abstract packets that are being moving throughout the I.O. request system. It could be on things like, you know, file system access. So the read and write, that obviously is looking at, you know, I want to send data to the thing. If I'm writing this blob of data, send it to the hard drive. Right, read is I want to read in this blob of data from the hard drive. Directory control is what's used actually for listing uh, directories if you're listing something on a file system. So that's relevant just for, you know, hiding files on a file system. But all of these potentially have utility for attackers. <coughs> just really depends on what they actually are trying to hide. Or intercept or monitor or whatever. So this is just, I posted the entire thing so you can see the names of the type of quote objects or IO requests that are going on. So at this point, I could show device tree, but I don't have it on my uh, USB token to, to put in there. And unfortunately, you have to register to download it at uh, OSR, OSR.com? OSRonline.com, actually. Yeah, there it is. Uh, unfortunately, you have to register to get this. So I'm, I'm not going to show this. And actually, I've been kind of going back and forth on whether I care to show this or not. The issue is the way that this shows um, the way that this shows chains is sort of <coughs> not useful. It's sort of useful. It's sort of not useful. The issue is you see right here where there's this DRV. These are a bunch of driver objects right here. The problem with this tool, the reason I I like it because it shows you information that it's hard to get through other things, but I dislike it because it won't show you a complete chain, whereas something like WinDebug will easily show you a complete chain. And I can't remember if Virus Block Ada does. I feel like it doesn't actually, but uh, Bill, over to the board. So you said there was control to cap and keyboard class. And there was I eighty forty two. There was whatever's there. ACPI, I think. Looking at this thing right now, for instance, I have it expanded here where it says driver I eighty forty two PRT, and then there's two devices associated with that. So for that particular driver, it exports uh, it. It created two devices. One of them is this unnamed thing right here. And another of them is, I think, another unnamed thing. This expansion is saying this driver created two devices. And for the second unnamed thing, there is attached to that keyboard class zero device and attached to that control to cap device, stuff like that. The problem is this is essentially showing you this, this part of the chain right now, right? It's saying this is associated with that chain. But that's not giving you the complete chain. In order to get the complete chain, you have to go down to ACPI and find the particular you know, empty device that points at that, that points at that, that points at that. In WinDebug, if you look anywhere on this chain, it'll just give you the entire chain. So I have the commands and I'll show them in a second. But to me, it's just much more useful to say, what does the entire chain look like, right? I said what we care about is knowing who should or shouldn't be in this chain. On a, you know, on a quote normal system, you know, MITRE system or whatever, which entries do we expect to be in this chain? So certainly we don't expect control to cap, but maybe we consider that a le legitimate thing, you know, close enough to legitimate as long as, you know, the driver is signed or something like that. So if we went and looked on someone's system and we saw control to cap, we wouldn't be too worried. But if we see something where we have no idea what it is, that's when we start to care. But with this uh, device tree, if you happen to just expand the wrong thing, then you're missing, you know, lower portions of the, uh, of the chain. Also, the other problem is it doesn't actually show the function pointer addresses in each of those device objects. So it'll say which things it actually listens to. So this will say, oh, okay, well, right now I have it clicked on Hacker Defender and it says Hacker Defender has registered callbacks for, you know, IRP create, close, read, write, device control, other things. And here we go. I mean, it's nice at least that this thing can even see the Hacker Defender thing, even though it's hiding itself. You know, it's hiding file system stuff. It's hiding registry stuff, but it just doesn't assume anyone's going to come in at the level of looking at driver objects and uh, device objects and stuff like that. So 
This tool is not in any way trying to get around rootkit hiding techniques. It just automatically can see that uh, driver object there. So that's there. You could maybe play with it. I think we'll have other tools that are better. Uh, but I guess here again, there's an example where you could maybe pick out something like this uh, control to cap and CTR12 cap. You know, and say, hey, it looks like one of those two is impersonating the other. I don't know which is which, but someone's impersonating someone else. But the question is, you know, are you going to really look through all of these devices and go with manual human inspection? That's probably not the best way to go about it. All right. So that's just a little bit of device tree. Here is like some window bug commands. You can play with these later. But like I said, the thing I like is that when you do this device stack command, you get the entire device stack. It's saying, and, and I should say that this was taken on a system that didn't have control to cap running at the time. Otherwise, you'd see control to cap in there. But ACPI, I8042, keyboard class, and anything else in that chain is going to be printed out there. So I'm going to, and I should, I'm going to pull all these Windabug commands out to the end and say, like, here's a reference. Here's how you look for SSDP hooks in Windabug. Here's how you look for, you know, IRP hooks and all that sort of thing. I'm just in the middle of that at the moment. But, uh, but here's how you print the entire IRP table. So you say for all of those uh, 28 things at the end of a device object. So if this was my, or sorry, driver object. If this is the address of my driver object, plus 38 equals the major function uh, entry. And then all of those 28 things at the end, this is uh, Windabug saying, you know, what is the symbol that's associated with this particular entry? And so in this particular case, it all works. Yes, yeah, it's reasonable. This, well, you wouldn't know unless you were looking at these other things, but this is the, for the I8042 uh, driver, PRT driver, this is the, the uh, major function table associated with it. So essentially this is, I just printed out all of that stuff right there. Good. I was just in Windabug and I dumped all that out for this particular device. Now, you saw a few of these pointed back into I8042, right? And some other ones pointed at NT, and they just sort of looked like placeholder entries. And again, I should say, point out, here's the major function list. So index 0 in that thing would have pointed at a create a function. Index 1 would have create, pointed at a create pipe. So if we go look at the thing in Windabug, you can see that they actually name them sort of appropriately, right? There's a function called, I don't know what that is, I8x maybe or L8x create. There's a function called I8x or yeah, I8x close, flush, device control, things like that. So they named them appropriate for, for the particular IRP that they're uh, managing. And the point is just as those IRPs are coming down, if the type is create, then the I.O. manager goes into this table and says, you know, I'm going to call your create function. And if your create function doesn't want to do anything, that's fine. It can just do nothing or you can put in a placeholder thing saying, you know, I'm not really going to do anything with this. Uh, but fundamentally, every driver has to have these registered if it's participating in I.O. request packets. So if you were to attach to some device chain and you had a zero here and if that thing ever comes down the chain, then you know, you'll cause a null pointer dereference. So if you're participating in IRPs, you have to have these filled in. And even if it's just a placeholder that does nothing and continues on to the next guy. All right. So to bring a little bit of relevance, I kind of already gave reference to this in that full net and uh, full disk encryption example. But this is from the semantic uh, Stuxnet dossier. dossier. Dossier, dossier, I think. Right? So actually a dossier. Um, and so now having, you know, a little bit more knowledge about rootkits, you can kind of parse what they're trying to get at with this write-up. And it, you can tease out some details that you wouldn't be able to get otherwise. All right. So it says, first Stuxnet, the driver scans the following file system driver objects. Slash file system NTFS, slash file system fastpat, slash file system CDFS. So the CDFS is for you know, CDs that you're putting into it. So NTFS, FAT, and CDs, it's saying it you know, scans each of those driver objects. So 
right? There's driver objects and there's uh, device objects. And the driver objects correspond to drivers. So there's an NTFS.sys, <coughs> there's a fastfat.sys, and there's a CDFS.sys. <coughs> then it says, a new device object is created by Stuxnet and attached to the device chain for each of the device objects managed by these driver objects. All right, so let's just parse that sentence right now. Uh, Bill, over to the board. Get rid of this. Thing. All right, so, so this, you know, the name of this actual driver object could be something like file system slash NTFS, something like that. It creates a, so the driver object may have that name. It creates a device object named just NTFS, or I think it's actually like slash NTFS. So this device object is associated with that file system. Stuxnet, it says, it's scanning for those particular things. And a new device object is created by Stuxnet and attached to the device chain for each of those device objects managed by those driver objects. So it says it's going to look at this particular driver object. That thing's going to have some number of devices, device objects that it's created. Some of them will be in this chain. So, so these things are chained together. This thing is maybe in a chain off to the side. This thing is maybe into the chain. Well, a given driver can create many devices. Those devices can be in many chains. Stuxnet attaches to the device chain for each device object, each device object right here, managed by this guy or FastFAT or CDFS. Right? So find it and attach to this chain somewhere. So here we're going to just say it's attached <coughs> to this chain for this NTFS driver or device object. And so, okay. Now Stuxnet is in this guy's chain. The mrxnet.sys driver will manage this driver object. So there you go. mrxnet.sys driver will manage this driver object. Okay. Driver object. And this thing creates a device object. All right. And we said it created a device object and it attached it to anything in those chains. So that guy manages this, whatever it's called, doesn't matter, they don't say. It's attached to uh, any of this stuff. And so now it's uh, intercepting our, well, now it's in a place where it can potentially find out about IO request packets targeting any of the devices managed by NTFS, FastFAT, and CDFS. Right? And so it says by inserting such objects, Stuxnet is able to intercept IRP requests examples, writes, reads, and everything else. So this little paragraph here, all it's telling you is you've got, you know, three different types of file system drivers, each of which manage potentially many devices, which are, you know, kind of exposed abstraction things having something to do with that file system. And Sexnet comes in and puts itself in the chain for each of those. All right, and then from here it says the driver monitors directory control IRPs, in particular uh, directory query notifications. So it's looking for IRPs coming down here, IRPs coming down this chain, you know, being consumed by someone. It's looking for ones which are of type directory control, uh, and so the major type turns out to be directory control the minor type turns out to be directory query. So we, we showed the major types. So right here, there was that IRP MJ directory control. So that's the specific type that Stuxnet is looking for coming down. And then there's a subtype, a minor. So these are the major functions. And then there's a minor function which is within that called directory query. So funny thing here is, this is an oh hi. I need a picture for that. Uh, so the heifer hook proof of concept code, which we have uh, in the VM, it's also doing this sort of thing, but it's doing it the other way. So uh, whereas Stuxnet is adding itself to this chain, and you know it's trying to pretend that it's a normal looking system component, and it's watching directory control and directory query 
type IRPs coming down. P for hook, which is installed in your VM, it's also looking for directory control and directory query IRPs, but instead of doing it, but instead of attaching to the thing, it comes in and it says, you know, where's that function pointer table associated with ntfs.sys? And it, you know, redirects these out here to point to P for hook. So when ntfs.sys finds out that there's a directory query thing, instead of its function calling to itself, it calls to heap for hook. And then heap for hook says, you know, okay, if this is of type uh, directory control and minor type query uh, directory, then go ahead and call this function, which is essentially going to check, is this one of the files which I'm hiding right now? If it is, then, you know, remove it from any listing of the directories. So two different ways to do it, but you can see that fundamentally they're looking for the same thing. This is sort of a known technique. I should say that he for hook was a, a rootkit that they stopped active development back in like 2002. So they, they originally did SSD key hooking in order to hide files. And then be, before they stopped development, they moved over to this IRP hooking in order to specifically this uh, major function hooking in order to hide files. And then they kind of just you know, let the project die, but it's still out there, full source code available. Uh, and so basically two different ways of doing the same thing, finding these IO request packets which relate to, you know, listing the direct, uh, listing the files in a directory. So you've got that in your VM, Stuxnet did that. It's a known technique, like I said, 2002 is when they stopped developing that. So it's been known that you look for those particular types of IR request packets and you filter them. If you filter them, you hide files. All right. Yep. So that, I think, is going to do it for IO request packets. And you scroll, I think, probably to the entire bottom. No, nope, not the entire bottom. All right. So it's got a sort of abbreviated uh, this is the abbreviated output. You can have it be more verbose if you want. But if you find a call, if uh, the type column says device, then it can say, for instance, file system slash NTFS. So that's what we said. That's the name of the driver object. And then the device object is just slash NTFS. So that's what we had up there. File system NTFS, NTFS. It's saying, okay, the value, and I mean, this is a little ambiguous. It's saying the value is 816 FD, and the only reason it will tell you this is because it's trying to say this is not what it should be. So unfortunately, that's a little bit too, you know, so it can't tell you what it's pointing at. It can't tell you, it's not telling you exactly what's happening. I'm going to show you how to do the verbose mode of this so that you, uh, in practice, you want to see exactly what's going on here. If you right click and you go to options, and then you select IRP hooks, now what it's going to do is it's actually going to print out each of the individual entries in the uh, major function table. So unfortunately, you're going to have to rescan. I'm going to, um, since I don't want it to take forever, I'm going to turn off system sections. I think all that should be required is devices. I'm going to turn off everything except devices, and then I'm going to rescan. And hopefully now it's going to show me like every single thing that's hooked. Oh, I guess before I go up, before I do that though, so two sides of this. For the device one, this is telling you IRP major function hooks. And for the, uh, there's this attached device thing. This is where it's telling you. Now here it's, I'm <coughs> fairly certain that it's using a heuristic here. I think what it's doing is using the heuristic that it's only looking for particular chains like the keyboard class chains because it knows that, you know, hey, people like to attach to the keyboard class chain to sniff uh, keystrokes, right? So for heuristically, it's saying, hey, there's something new attached to the uh, keyboard class chain and maybe you care about it, maybe you don't. It's saying it's the uh, control to cap dot sys. You know, you would Google that. But really what it's trying to say is attached devices is saying there's something new in the chain. And then device is saying someone's hooking the device. So I'm going to go ahead and scan it with only devices selected from the side. There we go. Now, now we're getting the verbose output. So it's saying device. And again, 
file system NTFS. NTFS, IRP MG uh, major create, so that's, you know, index 0 is hooked, and it's pointing at this address. Index 1 is hooked, it's pointing at that address. So they're all kind of pointing at the same address. So it turns out key for hook is actually taking all of those entries, pointing them at a single function, and then it's saying, you know, is the type, you know, directory control? Is the minor type query directory? Stuff like that. So it kind of hooks every single entry and points them all at the same place. And I've seen some write-ups which say that the reason a rootkit might do this is to uh, kind of make it harder to revert the changes. So I could see that kind of being true. We saw with that I-8042 that like a couple of the entries were filled in to be the, uh, well, what I'm talking about here is with this, for instance, right? You saw that it, a few of the entries were filled in with something specific, but a bunch of the entries were filled in with something default. And maybe if you saw that, like, something was hooked pointing out at some completely different module, maybe you could think, like, oh, I should go fill this in with an NT thing. I don't know that a detector slash removal device could necessarily get away with that heuristic without causing frequent crashes, but I'll just throw that out there to say that there may be some benefit to hooking every single thing so that it's not clear what the, what, where you would revert it to. Question? Um, so yeah, this is just the total hooks. Uh, yeah, and so these ones where it all points to the same thing, these are due to key for hook. These other ones, like this right here, are due to uh, the SRTS, SPTD.sys, the um, daemon tools component. And so there's actually these other sort of uh, function pointers beyond the uh, major function pointers which can be hooked in order to uh, intercept things, but I'm not going to talk about that in this class. You can see again, the fast fat, basically the same kind of thing Stuxnet went to, right? It went to fast fat. It would go to any devices attached to that, in this case, fat CD-ROM. All right, that's what it looks like in Gmer. Let's see what Toluca looks like. In Toluca, if I, this is definitely, <coughs> well, so, like I said, Gmer sort of uses a heuristic where it only shows you what's attached to the device chain if it thinks that you should care about it, something like keyboard class zero. Luca gives you a little bit more information in that you could say, okay, for this NTFS, uh, let me go ahead and see what all is attached to it. And you can say, well, there's a device attached to it with no device name, or sorry, yeah, device name, there's NC, which is associated with the driver name, which is the filter manager. So if you wanted, you can probably divine the, uh, well, let me try to, I haven't actually looked at this to try to define it, but let's say I know that inside this VM right now, I know that I have ACPI, I8042, keyboard class, control to cap. So, if I, I should be starting at driver named like ACPI, there's that. Yep, but that's not really helping me find the entire chain, right? So, ACPI gets me to driver PCI, but Ah, uh, there's the device. Yeah, so I think you could puzzle out the entire format of the tree from this, or from the, of the list from this, but obviously it's not particularly user friendly. It's certainly not as easy as just issuing device stack from Windabug and seeing those are the three things in the stack, those are the four things, whatever. Not as easy as a device tree where you can just expand stuff. And then uh, virus block ADA. All right, you would have to close out this uh, Windows, uh, Windows hooks. And then if you go to tools, driver IO handlers hooks. So this is again the case where, you know, you have to kind of know what you're looking for in order to interpret some of these tools. Right, what does a driver IO handler's hooks mean, right? IO handler, even. And it's, you kind of end up with, okay, it's dealing with 
these are I/O handlers as far as it's concerned, because you can see it's it's showing the various uh, major functions as well as those extra function pointers which can be intercepted. So these, the thing worth mentioning here is that although virus block ADA can revert a bunch of changes, it can't actually revert this level of change. So these I/O request uh, packet hooking uh, can't actually be reverted from within this. So you would have to identify what's causing the hook and then remove the file. And in, like you can see in some of these cases, uh, it's saying it's an unknown handler. It's pointing to memory where they don't even know what file it's associated with. So backtracking that to a driver which is causing the changes is definitely a pain. And so that's why that full attribution is something which has to be left for more advanced classes than this. But that's kind of another reason why you can see I/O request packet, why something like Stuxnet, um, well, if one is to assume that Stuxnet was trying to go for blending in, right, just attaching to the device chain like a normal thing rather than hooking into the I, uh, hooking into this major function is probably the way to go, right? It looks like a normal attachment of a device. Um, but simultaneously, then at least the attribution can be made of you can see there's this new device. You can see this is you know, mrxnet.sys. So there's kind of these trade-offs where if you think the defender doesn't even know how to look at this level, this would probably be the better level to do it. If you think the defender is never even going to check the I/O request chain and you want to just sort of blend in, then maybe that level is the way to do it, as well as stability concerns with doing these hooks. All right, so that's all we're going to say about I request packets, and we're going to move on. All right, so we're going to talk about uh, DCOM. Just we kind of already touched on a lot of this, but um, so DCOM direct <coughs> kernel object manipulation. <coughs> the canonical example is taking a linked list and removing an entry from the linked list, as long as that doesn't you know break anything else throughout the system. As I said before, there's also use of DCOM for uh, token elevation and, and improve, uh, increasing the, the uh, privilege of a particular process, for instance. Right? And I've already talked about this. Do I have the example here? Oh, yeah, I skipped one thing. Yeah, so I was just going to, you know, give credit where it's due. So I said, Jimmy <coughs> Butler. Uh, came up with this technique and described it in 2004 for the FU rootkit, the FU rootkit. Um, the point was that, you know, he had been working on the typical types of rootkits where they hook the SSDT, for instance, and he knew that was eminently detectable. The SSDT entry should always point at N2S kernel or the shadow SSDT should always point at win32k.sys. So he knew these would be easily detectable. So he came up with this technique in order to, um, in order to raise the bar here. And simultaneously, he then, you know, uh, presented Vice at the same time. Vice was something, you know, Vice catch the hookers. It was a tool which is trying to detect the prevailing method at the time. So you could say, hey, I've got a new, better technique. And for everyone who's using those old techniques, you know, you're now easily going to be detected. Of course, as we said. Way back when we were talking about type one rootkits and stuff like that, right? It may be the case that you know something may be technically detectable. I put out a rootkit detection tool, check the SSDT, right? So now just go forth and detect rootkits, right? But uh, because something, even things like Vice, it's really meant to be double clicked on, you know, a system. Uh, it's it didn't have you know some large scale effect of detecting people who are doing SSDT. And even beyond that, there's all these problems with, as we're showing, that the, um, the third-party security software is hooking the SSDT and hooking inline and hooking IRPs and stuff like that. So it makes it difficult to uh, baseline what your expectations are. Well, it doesn't make it difficult to baseline what your expectations are. It makes it difficult to, in the absence of a baseline, say that's good, that's bad. All right. So like we talked about, moving lists. Uh, yeah, I kind of 
I think I keep always stealing the thunder before I get to the, the decom slides. So I go too much into it at the beginning. So we already said, you know, remove something from the list. It's still going to get scheduled, but it's not going to show up in Task Manager, for instance. Right? Then I talked about the little uh, back and forth arms race thing here. So FU was being able to be detected by stuff like F-Secure Blacklight because they did a brute force over the PIDs. What I didn't say before was the actual name of the table and things, but it was uh, when uh, Peter Silberman uh, improved FU so that it wouldn't be detected by Blacklight, he went in and he reversed the system and said, what is open process actually using behind the scenes? <coughs> And what he found was, behind the scenes, it actually all eventually went down to the use of this PSP SID table, which is just a data structure uh, in the back end where it gets filled in with uh, handles for all of the open processes when, when, they, uh, when they're created. And so Blacklight was fundamentally checking that table. It was doing it indirectly. They, you know, they didn't necessarily know that that's what was going on behind the scenes. But indirectly, by calling all open process over every single PID, they were consulting with that table. And whatever they got from that list versus what they got from create tool help 32, this was, that's a function which behind the scenes consults the e-process list. They just compared those lists. And if anything shows up, uh, if anything shows up in the PSP SID table list that doesn't show up in the other one, then they can say, okay, this is being hidden through DECO. So that's that cross view detection. So Silverman introduced uh, Foo2, and what he did then was he went into the PSP SID table and he removed the entry. But there was actually a little bit of a uh, trick that had to go on there because if you remove the entry, then when you terminate the process, that PSP SID table is going to have a null entry for this uh, open handle table, and something's going to try to dereference that null, and it's going to crash. So he actually had to use a technique which we're going to learn about next, I think. He had to use a technique in order to see when is this process about to terminate. So you can find out, hey, this process is about to terminate, and when he sees it's one that he's hiding, then he goes back into the PSP SID table, fills it back in, and lets it terminate as normal. So he used a, a um, well, he used an OS level callback, which I think is going to be the next topic we're going to talk about in order to find out this process is terminating. And that way, you got around black light, first level, but then there's uh, but uh, then there's other tools which can. Uh, I don't think Klister is the right one. I can't remember now what the correct one is. Klister is for finding kernel modules which are unlinked. Uh, I think kernel modules which are unlinked with DCOM. But there's a different tool by John Orkowska which actually goes and looks at the um, the threads, like I said before. If the kernel is going to use threads as a list for what has to be scheduled, then obviously the attacker can't remove themselves with, from the threads, uh, and therefore you can use that to see what should be scheduled unless someone goes and does their own schedule. All right. Yep, so this is the next part. All right, not much to, not much to ask questions on for DCOM, but does anyone have any questions on DCOM before we go on? All right. So OS level callbacks. So when we were talking before about um, when we were talking before about patch guard and things like that, I said you know Microsoft is trying to push people away from using the quote unsupported mechanisms uh, on the system like hooking the SSD key, doing inline hooks, things like that. Trying to push people away from that, and they're trying to provide an API which lets security tools and other things uh, find out about the types of events on the system that are occurring, which they wanted to know about, and which they uh, historically would use those SSDT hooks, for instance. All right, and so the type of actions which this, these various APIs can monitor are, for instance, registry actions. So anytime a, pro a registry entry is created, deleted, queried, um, opened, whatever else, a bunch of different types of actions on registry that can occur. In the kernel, you can call this function CM register callback or CM register callback X. And what's going to happen is when the kernel is off about to, you know, write to the registry or anything else, 
it goes and it consults a list where it says, here are the functions in different modules which want to find out about registry activity. And so the OS is going to call you back and say, dear, you know, what's something that uses it? Dear he for hook. And which one did it use? Yeah. Red notifier too. Dear he for hook, a new well, I haven't got there yet, but a new thread is being created right now. Here's the information about the thread. Do what you're going to do. And, you know, when you're done, return, and I'll call the next thing that wants to hear about the thread information. So these can be used by security tools. So I said uh, when I was working on the Honey Client project, uh, the, the, the program which we integrated called Capture, or sometimes Capture Bat if it's your standalone form. Uh, this this honey, client side honeypot thing, Capture, it used these things like CM register. It, it had the registry callbacks to find out all the registry activity on the system. It had the process callbacks to find out every time someone starts a new process. And it had the file system callback down here at the end to find out any time something is written to disk. So, you know, be, between those you can find a, a pretty decent view of uh, what's currently going on in the system, especially a honeypot system where nothing should ever be going on except, you know, the browser running. Uh, so you filter out the browser events and then everything else, if any registry events ever occur, that's bad. <coughs> if any process events occur, that's bad. Or at least in the honeypot system. Right, so these are meant for use by security tools so that they can, let's say you're a file system integrity check product like Bit9 or something like that. Uh, maybe you want to have this file system callback so that when someone's writing a new file to the file system, you internally in your own metadata say this is an approved file or this is, you know, a new file which is not acceptable. And then when someone goes to click on that file, you have another callback, the, uh, for instance, the image, load image notify routine. Load image notify routine basically makes it so that right when a file is mapped into memory before the OS even calls the entry point of that function, of that module, you're going to find out about it. So I'm a security tool. And I want to know if a new DLL is loaded so I can, you know, scan its memory to see if it's good or bad or anything like that. By registering this load image routine, I can see, okay, this just opened up. There's a DLL. It's about to run. But the question is, am I, um, is this something which I currently am allowing to run? Or is this something, you know, it's, if you're like a whitelisting system, you say, is this on my whitelist or is it not? You know, if you're on a blacklisting system, is this on my blacklist or is this not? And based on that, then you allow or deny the uh, program to run further from that point. So that's how security tools would use this, but this is how rootkits would use these. So key for hook, you have the source will be available when I distribute stuff, but like I said, it's also in the net. Key for hook uses a thread notify routine so that every time a new thread is started, uh, it can find out about it and uh, manipulate data associated with that. Puto, this used a create process notify routine. Now, the name is kind of misleading there because uh, it makes it sound like it's going to notify you every time create process is called or every time a new process <coughs> is created. But it also notifies you when a process terminates. So it'll tell you when process starts or tell you when a process is ending. And that's where I said Puto. It removed that particular, you know, that open handle out of the PSP SID table. It removed that out of there, but it knows that if the process terminates without putting that back, it'll just crash. So it registers this thing to find out when the process is terminating, and then it fills it in and it allows it to terminate the rest of the way. And so that's just sort of a support routine, it, you know, tangential to the main function. It's just a uh, way to do that. All right. So so Fudo and Heathrow, those are sort of proof of concept ones. Uh, in the wild things, Black Energy 2 and Rustock, those use uh, either thread notify routines or process routines. Uh, hybrid hook was, is a proof of concept thing that was on rootkit.com. This one was sort of interesting because it took a uh, load image notify routine, meaning, okay, this kernel module will register to find out anytime any new kernel module or DLL or EXE is loaded. When a new DLL is loaded, or let's say when a new kernel module is loaded, what it's going to do is immediately put in an IAT hook. So it says, I can see that this thing was just loaded into memory. 
I'm going to parse its headers, go find its IAT, and then I'm going to, you know, scribble all over it and say, you know, when you're going to call some function, instead you're going to call me. And so that's, you know, a nice little trick there to make it so that we said before there was that problem of IAT hooks where typically you inject yourself and you hook everything that's there right now, but if something new comes in, then you need to like have some way to find out about that. Otherwise, it's going to come in, it's not going to be hooked, and then it'll potentially, you know, worst case for a rootkit is the new thing that comes in is a security tool, and you have it hooked to IAT, and then it, you know, wanders around and sees that you're installed, right? So in this case, it doesn't matter if a security tool comes in because the rootkit's there first, and the rootkit finds out about every single module that gets loaded into memory, and it goes ahead and puts an IAT hook in it to basically subvert what the security tool sees, for instance. All right, TSS or TDSS or TDL3, just different names for the same thing. Uh, that uses a load notify routine in order to actually inject DLLs into user space things. So it carries the DLL with it. It finds out when new processes are starting and it injects a DLL into the user space uh, component from kernel space. So that's interesting. And then Stuxnet, again, if you know about this sort of thing, you can parse the uh, dossier a little better. It says, the driver also registers a file system registration callback routine in order to hook newly created file system objects on the fly. Right? So I don't know for sure if that's uh, the specific thing that it's referring to or because it's talking about file system objects. I think that is. I mean, I don't know. The way I would parse it is that it's using uh, one of, I think there's actually some more file system callbacks that I didn't list. But uh, it's saying that, you know, it's using file system callbacks in order to find when uh, new files are being created. New file system objects, right? So, uh, yeah. The point was, oh, what was Microsoft's point of, of adding them in there? Well, the point was to get people away from places where uh, you have ambiguity and mixing of, if the point was to get them away from where you have ambiguity and mixing like the SSDP, right, where it's not clear if this is security software hooking or uh, it, it probably wasn't more about the ambiguity because this still has the ambiguity. It's probably more about with things like SSDT hooking, right? There's only one function pointer there. And whoever comes in and does the SSD to the hook, they're going to copy whatever's there right now, and then they're going to call that later, for instance, right? They're going to put themselves there, and they're going to say, well, whatever was there right now, I'm going to call that later. But the problem is when you get multiple security programs, each of which, you know, copies that thing off to the side and says, I'm going to call that later, if they're not doing things really carefully, they very easily add instability into the system, and in the kernel, that means blue screen. So by using these unsupported mechanisms where you know, these two programs are hooking the SSD key, but they happen to point at a function where now there's some other program that's hooking it inline. All of these unsupported hooking mechanisms very quickly lead to potential for instability. I, I think, let's say that instability rather than ambiguity is the bigger reason. By creating these APIs, they are now creating a well-known and well-controlled means by which to transition from one thing to the next thing, right? So security product A registers a callback to find out about images notifying or, or loading of images. Security product B registers it. The OS, when the event occurs, it calls the one that returns. It goes into its list. It calls the next one that returns. goes into its list, calls the next one that returns. And so it, it has a uh, better OS-mediated way of... Uh, transition they have and beyond that the data which is going into these is all you know specified and restricted they say you know this is the type of data you're going to get and you need to be able to deal with this type of data so there's only these are the only types and at least in the registry for instance they're you know for a while well not even for a while something like XP will have lesser capabilities than something like Vista so there will be as they go on they're adding you know more features to it so that the software can potentially intercept more types of activities and stuff like that. Um, 
And so being able to specify like here's what we're allowing you to access, what type of events we're allowing you to access, uh, they restrict it down to known data types using a known mechanism, I think is what it really comes down to. Yeah, I don't think they were doing it. No, I don't, they weren't really doing it to get rid of Lucas. It does have the tangential benefit that when you push people out of the SSDT, you can go back to the saying, you know, this should never change, and they can try to enforce it from within the operating system. But like I said, because of things like boot kits where, you know, the attacker gets in there, they turn off the internal protections. Uh, I'm kind of of the opinion that, you know, they're doing the best they can from their perspective. They're, they're in a system and they're trying to treat the system like it's standalone. They can't talk out to anything to say, you know, I'm good or I'm bad or anything like that. And so from the perspective of only internal to the system, they're doing the best that they can. They just use things like obfuscation to try to make it harder for the attacker to mess with them. But I think really when you start talking about rootkits, you need to have external attestation is what we call it in research circles where you have to be able to provide trustworthy information outside of the system so that someone external can uh, appraise whether or not this thing uh, is in a trusted state. <coughs> so, one, I introduced the callbacks to say, here's the fundamental capabilities that they offer. Two, I said, you know, security software uses it, but so does rootkits. So three, that means we need to have ways to look at the callbacks and see what's registered and figure out, you know, what should or shouldn't be registered on our, quote, expected system. All right, so this is one way. Again, I'm going to pull this all to the end. Uh, these Analyze V uh, blog posts have posted information about, uh, it basically is just parsing the data structures used behind the scenes uh, to hold these lists of callbacks to see who's going to get called back. Mm -hmm. But what I found was, so did I delete it? Yeah, so I didn't delete it yet. Originally, I was going to point out rootkit on hooker, which was at least nice in that for a couple types of callback routines, it would tell you, but it was missing a bunch of stuff. But, you know, once I found virus block ADA, this is definitely the superior way to go, especially with this beta version. So with the version before the beta one, it was missing a bunch of stuff as well. But now it's, it's in a good place. So. Uh, go into your VM and uh, close down that IRP thing. And there we go. Under Tools, Kernel Mode notif Notificators. Uh, come on, they're Belarusian. Give me a break. Kernel Mode Notificators. Select that and it's going to go enumerate. It's, they, you know, reverse engineered the structures which are used in the background to store the list of everyone that wants to find out about one particular callback or another. So, there's a couple funny things here, funny to me at least. OS callbacks are the new SSDT as far as I'm concerned, right? So you've got a bunch of things which are all registering and saying, I want to find out when this thing occurs. If you're an attacker, it behooves you to go in there, know how these structures work, and go remove defender tools, for instance, or, you know, put yourself in so that you're definitely the first thing in this array. So if the OS comes through and it's actually different in different operating systems. In like XP, most of these, I believe, are stored as an array. So there's like a count that says, I've got three callbacks. They start here. That's the first function pointer. That's the second. That's the third, right? So if you're an attacker, it behooves you to know how that works and make sure you put yourself first in the array, you know, move whoever else is out, out to the end of it. Two, if you're an attacker, you could just go through and like remove a bunch of stuff in order to disable uh, some of the security software's features, right? And then three, if you're an attacker, you know, obviously putting yourself into this list is a good way to put yourself in a position to prevent security tools from loading, prevent other rootkits from loading, stuff like that. So as you can see, it's going through again. It's looking for signed drivers, stuff like that. If you uh, sort by type. There's some things like bug check. This is when, when a blue screen occurs. It's, it's actually a type of error like a bug check. And, but things can register to find out if a blue screen is about to occur. Uh, and so those are one type of callback. 
here we have two entries. We've got a create process, which points at an unknown handler. I'm going to have to think about this. I think I'm pretty sure that's um, for hook. I could go check the memory space, but I think that's C for hook actually. And I know I said that it only loads a uh, red callback, but um, that was based on me looking at the uh, source code, and I didn't find anywhere where it was looked like it was loading a uh, process callback. So I may have just looked at the source code wrong. But I had found other information to indicate that Deeper Hook was loading both a process and a thread one. So anyways, the point here would be, right, so if you're doing this, so this is kind of a point I wanted to make at other areas as well, but if you're doing this on a single system, Figuring out what should or shouldn't be here is pretty hard, right? But if you're doing this across multiple systems, where multiple ideally means maybe more than more than two, so let's say maybe ten and above, right? So if I took all of these systems in here right now in this lab, and I had let's say that I had this which was able to spit it out to standard out, I was able to read that in, put it into a database table, and you know histogram it, for instance. I'd say, okay, all of these things have all of the same uh, function pointers registered for callbacks, except you know, that one right there. That one has one extra thing. That's the kind of thing which you want to investigate first. Right? <laughs> it's when you start having outliers here. So you can go in and you can manually look at every single entry and you can Google it and you can check digital signatures and stuff like that. But it's only when you start comparing across systems where the systems are expected to have uh, you know, semi-equivalent baselines that you can start getting at what should or shouldn't be there. Uh, at least I'd say that's, from prioritization perspective, that's where you really want to start. Now, if you can't do that, right, so like in this example case where, uh, you know, someone sits you down at a system and they say, here's the system, we think it's suspicious, right, so you, st you still want to potentially Ask them, do you have any other servers which are supposed to be equivalent of this? You know, is there any load balancing going on? You know, is this system supposed to look at like this other system? If so, even a two system difference, uh, two system diff, running a tool on both of them and seeing what's different uh, can be extremely useful. Because if you can't do that, you end up having to, you know, rely on, you know, just experience, which, you know, most of you don't have experience with this and you wouldn't be expected to know, you know, this should be there, this shouldn't be there. So um, that was just a little point I wanted to make about, you know, the, let's say, the actionability of figuring out which of these hooks is or isn't bad. Now, in certain cases, certainly you can say that if something points into memory space where this tool can't even figure out what that's pointing at, that's probably a bad thing. Maybe there's some security software out there which does something weird in order to point at that. But generally speaking, that's suspicious. But knowing that's suspicious doesn't help you figure out what's actually doing that, right? That's again, we fall back to that problem of you have to go in there and start reverse engineering the code. You have to go to that address and look at the code there and figure out if it ever points to some other address that looks like the kernel module. Or if it doesn't, if it's just dynamically allocated code, then you have to um, then you have to start hooking every allocation of memory and say, who put this code there? And doing that after a reboot. And that gets to be a sticky problem, which again is beyond the scope of this class. So the main thing I wanted to say uh, for this OS level callbacks before we take a break, and actually I think we'll, uh, we'll call it a day at this point. But um, the main thing I wanted to say is these callback mechanisms are here for uh, third-party software to monitor the system, things like security software, they want to see processes that are loading, uh, things like that. But this can also be abused by rootkits. So you need to know of its existence. You need to have tools which can actually show you this. And until recently, there weren't really good tools which could show you this sort of information. Oh, and the other thing I want to say is 
again, virus block ADA is good in that it can actually remove these entries. So I said it parses the structures and it knows this is an array. So they can actually remove an entry from the array, squeeze the array down, decrement the size, stuff like that. So uh, this can be, again, fun for, you know, like I said, most security software is not smart enough that if you go in here and remove these things, all of a sudden this or that tool stops working completely and it just falls over. Fails open. <coughs> so, let me see if I got anything else there. Otherwise, yep. All right. So, bootkits is going to be the topic for tomorrow to start out. Any questions on call?